I must say, I think that my personal favorite piece is this woman with the crows there. Oh. Um, she, she seems like Celtic or something or like, I don't know. She just, I love her. Well, I started, uh, I discovered the Celts in the sixties when I was in college. I never, um, Put it this way, in most school, I've talked to a lot of people. When they went to high school, what history you had was usually American history, and if it was European history, they just talked about the main civilizations like Egyptians or you know, Greeks, Romans. Yeah. Um, you know, then uh, Italy and all, you know. Yeah, yeah, Western European. And they skipped. You look on a map and you see Germany, France, England, Ireland, it was just like blank. <laughs> way back, it was just nothing. It was just, I'm like, well, people live there. I mean, yeah. we know people live there. Who were they? What were they? Nothing. So I was in college. I was taking history classes. I'd taken two classes. And, uh, and still, nobody. I'm like, who? Oh, there might be people living there. And they, I think they're the kind of people I want to. I want to draw and paint, you know, so, so, and, um, at that time, Frazetta, the artist, Frank Frazetta, he'd done his first Conan cover, and it was mm. in the 60s, and I'd seen that, and I'm like, oh, my God, that looks like a character that's, that's straight out of fantasy, but that looks like the people I'm trying to find, which I think they might look like that. So finally, I found a book in the library that mentioned the word Celts. First time I saw, mm -hmm. they label, well, first of all, they label, they show a map and label all that part of Europe, uh, Northwestern Europe, as battle axe cultures. Well, that just fired my imagination up even more, battle axe cultures. Yeah. And so finally I saw mentioned Celts, and uh, I'd already done some research on, so a little bit of reading and stuff on Vikings. I found a few little things about it, but it's just talking about the Vikings, not a whole lot of history. So once I found the Celts, then the uh, you know, the Brits, the you know the, the original well they were Celtic, but then Ireland Celtic, uh, France most of France was well France was Celtic, the Germans I found out they were like super Celts except <laughs> they had different they, they were just bigger meaner and tougher, but they had um, a different religion than the Druid religion of the of the Celts. That's about all separate them, and. Um, so I was reading all I could. And then when I got out of the Army in 71, uh, I joined a history book club. And mm -hmm. they had just come out with these new books. And it was on the Celts. And uh, I was like, oh, God, you know. So I got those. And, and Vikings, I read more about the Vikings and Celts. All the northern, well, basically European, European tribes um, mm -hmm. people lived in there. And so I fell in love with that. And started doing drawings and paintings of that years before I started at TSR. And um, I think my portfolio at that time had a lot of the Celtic type drawings. Of course, nobody even know the word. I, I just, anybody, I mean, kids, you know, college professors always say Celts. And they're like, I don't know who you're talking about. Um, it's like nobody knew about it. Unless you were really an ancient history major or something. That yeah. was it. And, um, you were before your times. You knew. Yeah, but I had to dig for it. and I, I didn't You were know. ahead of the trend. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, when I saw Frazetta's painting, it, it's like, oh, my God, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I realized that I don't think from what I was reading that, that they quite look like that. But it's fantasy. You can do what you want to because who's going to say you're wrong unless yeah. you know, they got photos of what they look like. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, and, uh, but it was that in the fantasy where you say, "Okay, I can be somewhat wrong, or I can make up stuff because it's fantasy." Yeah, but I, I was at a, I had to root my fantasy in something. It was just um, Celts and ancient Germans and and uh, cool. Did Brits. you have a Did you have a specific model for this, or was the yes. their story behind it? Yeah, this. Well, I uh, I was. Uh, I don't know if the, the image sort of came to me one time, a rough 
I did, I did some little sketch work. And uh, again, it was, it was more like Celtic or something or Druid type. Uh, maybe I'll can't remember now if all the Druid priests were men. I think there were women as well. I'm almost 95% sure. But um, it'd be like a, um, um, uh, a witch, witchy kind of woman or, a, you know. She whatever. has a dark intensity. Yeah. Got a good stare and mm-hmm. eyes, face look good. And I just, I just did this. And the girl that modeled for me is my wife's cousin. She had just gotten out of high school, and um, and I, uh, I didn't know her really, and saw her at some place. My wife said, "Yeah, that's my cousin." I said, "Would she model for me?" I'm like, "I asked her." She said, "Yeah, she probably would if you ask her." Well, if I asked her, and she said, "Sure." And so, actually, her her and her sister modeled for me too along the years. Neat. But she modeled for me for a summer. And uh, and so I got several shots of her. I've, I've used several of those pictures. She had, just had an interesting face, and mm-hmm. uh, and she could, if you give her a a, a mo a mood, describe what you're looking for in the painting. You know, in my mind, I knew what I was looking for. I, was, I would try to set that mood and say, "That's who you are in this painting." Mm-hmm. Uh, and she could hit it pretty good. She could give you a good stare or a mean look without frowning all up, you know, just with her eyes. Yeah. And, but it's Very hard cool. to get. But Very it, yeah, cool. it's a good model. Speaking of stares, this next gentleman has a stare. Yeah. He has very intense stare. I could think of him as a knight or. Um, what's the story behind these well, three characters? This is a book cover, and I think it's called Son of the Dark Sword. It's a series. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, oh, Larry. Again, I can't think of the author. Crap. I know him. Too. I think his first name is Larry. <laughs> Your first name's Larry. <laughs> Larry and Larry. Uh, yeah. It's funny, I can remember images, paintings, and how I paint them, and everything else, but names. And, but anyway, I, I read get them it. Paintings and artwork are a way they, they, they fire the synapses and cement it in your brain. It creates a memory. That must be it. Because uh, uh, I read the manuscript for the book and uh, mm-hmm. I had to come with a painting. And I was going to. Gary Khan and um, and I had some friends they were from Florida they'd come up and they were doing uh, like karaoke and running all that for at night for a party and everything and they had a friend that was with them all the time and he was really well that guy that modeled for me I can't describe his looks he was handsome he was uh, intense looking he uh uh, I think he was shaved his head uh, when I first met him in but later on he kept his head shaved all the time. He could be scary looking if he wanted to, but he was just a ball of fun. There was nothing weird about him as far as his personality. Yeah. But, uh, so I was at Gary Con. I mean, I was at Gen- Dragon Con. I took my iPhone and shot some shots of his face. And, um, and so I just uh, worked from those and then... Uh, Oh. So this piece is a little bit more recent. If you were using an iPhone, yeah, it was uh, probably down below. It's got a date. I would say it had to be uh, in the two thousands. Uh, Neat. That's probably about five or six years ago. Five years cool. ago. Cool. Cool. And, and then um, you've got kind of the alien in the background there. Yeah, it's a, it's actually a character in the series is sort of social elite sort of priest or whatever they were um mm-hmm. they wore a mask and you would recognize them by their mask oh um, and they were in public i think it was they always wore masks and um uh, and i don't know what the setting I, i'm like i knew this guy was a fighter um mm-hmm. if you can see the rest of the painting he's holding the hilt of a dark sword it was just super yeah. black 
no shine to it, just a flat black. Yeah. And uh, um, you've really got that triangle composition too. Uh, so you've got the building, and you've got the mountains, and the two characters in that inverted triangle leading down to that like intense a, like stare. A big arrow, arrow that just points straight to. Uh, it comes to the point about the guy's chest, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just, it really keeps you in and focused. Um, but yeah, the armor, I asked what kind of um, time period could you relate to this? It's fantasy, but you know, you need to, you know, for architecture. Uh, right. For, like armor. And they said, well, it's sort of like if you took Chinese, India, uh, China, India, and some other. Um, Eastern countries there, and yeah. sort of blend them into blend them in together, mm -hmm. <laughs> and come out with a look of armor and 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 uh, they said that the buildings were they did give me a, a really clear reference, but for me in the book it was that's about as close as I could guess from what I know. There's domes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, do you use references for your armor when you paint? Do you have pictures from like well, uh, museums that you reference? Well, there's, yeah, I could reference, but like that armor, it had to be something totally different, you know, so there's no armor like it. Right. Yeah, right. I, I looked up uh, just different types of armor and designs. It, I knew it had to have a bit of a um, Eastern flavor to it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so yeah it was it was the painting is a really good painting i don't like it uh, it came out just like i wanted it to i, I envisioned okay. it. it was just like yeah. bam i did it and um i've taken it to shows but so i don't know people don't really uh jump on it you know they're like yeah it's pretty and that's it but <laughs> I like it because I don't know. I like the subject matter. I like the way it's painted. Yeah. Um, sometimes the the painting we you were just talking about with the witch and the ravens or the crows, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I did that painting and I made prints of it. The first year I I tried to sell prints, I was going to a lot of conventions, and I couldn't sell prints of it. Nothing. Like two two and a half years go by, we'd sold maybe three or four prints, and I was like, what am I going to? What am I going to have to do? Destroy all these prints I made and just forget about it? And then about three or four years after I painted it, all of a sudden it caught on. I don't know. I guess the country changed or something. The mood. Yeah. Of I sold them all out, all my prints in a, probably about three years. I mean, I just huh. the conventions. Why do you I, think that is? Why do you think a print oh, could be popular it. and that or not popular then suddenly become popular i think it's sometimes you're painting beyond uh what the fad is i never followed a fad uh sometimes I've been forced to paint things i didn't want to but because the book cover and i had to make a living mm -hmm, but, uh, mm -hmm. I, I never tried to copy other artists or, or do fad kind of work mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in three paintings i think i've done paintings that it was ahead of the fad. Mm. You know, like it took two years for people to come around and it's like, oh, that's they were ready for it. Right. And that's good. If you're paying ahead, that's good. Yeah. Uh, but then there's, you know, I don't know. You just paint. Sometimes you're painting ahead. Sometimes you're not. I've never tried to paint like somebody else or try to rip off subject matter. I just, I've, I, I did my work. Yeah. Illustrate a book. I illustrate a cover. When I do my own personal work, though, I really think about it. And as I always paint something I feel, not something I've seen, but something, you know, like other artists. I, I try not to look at any other art, just, just go into myself. And it takes about three days of just being more alone and listening to music and, and uh, almost meditating. And then I start getting mm. out. It's like a little visuals start popping up and that's i call it going to my river really uh, going to your river like uh, going to the well almost yeah going to the well the reason i call it that this is uh you call it the river though because it flows well i was 
I've had one time in my life where it's like, I guess you call it a, uh, what's the term for when the artist can't think of anything to paint, you just dry up. It's like you're a block. An artist artist block. block. Yeah. Like writer's I, block, but artist block. I never had that before. And then one time when I had some time to do some paintings for myself, I couldn't think of anything. Well, then once I couldn't think of anything, it got worse because I worried about it. So this was going on for a year. I could do illustrations for a book cover or something because the subject matter was already there. But do my own work, I couldn't think of nothing. And I was starting to worry about it. I thought, well, my career is over. I, I, I stink. Oh, no. I feel good. Might as well hang it up. <laughs> Go get a job. I mean, as an artist, what do you get a job as? A janitor, you know? I haven't had any training for other jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all I know is art. So, well, I've read and kept up with everything, but, you know. Right. Um, so I worry about this, really worry. So I, 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 there's an artist called Cirillo. Um, he is a great artist. Uh-huh. He lives in Spain. And uh, he grew up in, um, in South America. Uh, he's... He's a unique person. I've never met anyone like him, like him in my life. I met him several years ago, years ago. I guess probably back in the 80s. I don't know, back in the early 90s at Dragon. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, I met him, I was in Italy. I had come to a convention there, and he, he, he was living there then. And he, or he, I think he was, I don't know. Anyway, he introduced himself. He had done a little bit of work for TSR, just starting to break into it. He's He's a good 10 years or so younger than me, at least, uh-huh. maybe 15. And uh, he was telling me he's such a fan and everything, and I, I really liked the guy. And, and then later on, he starts getting published, so we'd go by, go ahead a few years, and I would see him at Dragon Con. We would talk, and he was just, I don't know, like a holy man. That, that mm. He was wise beyond his years. And he, um, he really started getting into the, the South America, uh, the you know the Incas, Aztec, studying all the spiritualism and everything, all this. Yeah. And, and he just kept broadening it. And every time we get together at a convention, so we end up talking all night long. And uh, we had some of the same interests and same little bit of research. And but he's like a, an old soul. You heard of that? Yeah. Term? He's a very old soul. So did and he I, help you over your uh, artist uh, block? Well, how am I going to? Yeah, he was living at that time in Spain. I like, I didn't, they weren't bothering. So I went to a convention in Italy and he was there and he had a booth right across the aisle from me. But the convention was so packed, so many people and we were so busy, we couldn't even, every once in a while we would, if we looked up and saw each other, we'd just sort of nod our head, say hi, and that was it. Then right at the end, when the convention closed at night, be a bunch of his group would grab him and a bunch of my group grab him and take us to eat two separate directions. Mm. So finally there was, I realized it was about 20 minutes before all of our people got everything together to take us to go eat in separate directions. And I thought the, the commission closed. And I thought, I need to talk to him. I think he can help me. I really think he can help me yeah. if anybody can. And so finally uh, everybody was sort of, just he and I was standing there in front of our booth, just to calm down. And, um, and I asked, I said, uh, he said something to me like, Larry, are you okay? I went, like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I oh. thought it was like, like he could read my heart, you know? And he said, I told him, I said, I can't, I'm not creative anymore. I can't think of anything. It's gone. I lost it. Now, nah, blah, blah, blah. He said, um, he put his arm around me and he said, uh, Larry, what now when we say god we just say the powers that be okay there's a lot of religions uh-huh. of gods but he said i use the word god he used and he said god gave you this ability for your art and he said what he gives you only he can take back and i don't think he's taking your ability back he said you're your art talent, your ability, your creativity is like a river that runs through your soul. And it's still there. It didn't dry up. He said, you've wandered away from it. He said, mm. how busy 
And, and he knew that I'd been oh, extremely busy going to convention, doing art, working myself to death. I'd probably had a stroke or something too, somewhere in that process. <laughs> no, oh. I had not. Oh, no. I was early. I've, I've had a few heart attacks. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, I'm sorry. He said, uh, well, I've died a couple of times, but hey, I'm alive oh. and kicking. I'm doing fine now. But uh, Glad anyway, to hear he it. said, you've been so busy doing everything. He said, "Yeah, you, you know, you're, you're you're making good money, but you're 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 working, working, working." I said, "Yes, I'm working myself to death." And I said, "I've used up all my creativity." He said, "No," he said, "You have been so busy, you've wandered away from your well, from your river." He said, "That creative river in your soul, it's there, but you mm-hmm. let everything distract you to you wander around, and and now you're lost." He said, "You've got to find your way back to your river." I said, "Well, how?" He said, "You know how." He said, follow your heart, follow your soul, get rid of all the, all the things that's just keeping you away, you know, that keeps you so busy with trite stuff and just little paintings that's not mounting to anything, you know, and all this stuff. And so many conventions. So I got back home and he also gave me a little book he'd written, uh, these little thin books with thin books with a few little pictures. They're not very big. And he said, read this. On the way back from the airport, I back flying back here, and so I did. And that just there were just little sayings he'd come up with, with little drawings, and more, I guess, sort of spiritual kind of yeah. things he'd done. So I got back home. I started listening to the music I like. I started looking inside myself. Started looking at all the reference materials I'd shot, photos I'd shot to my life. Yeah. And it took about, I told my wife, I said, don't bother me. I just closed the door studio. I said, I don't be interrupted. Uh, you know, if I go to bed at three in the morning, that's okay. So I did that about three nights. And then all of a sudden, it's like, it all came back in a rush. And I got ideas for like four paintings, uh, good ideas, which I later painted them all. And uh, I found it again. And um and since then, I've never wandered very far away from my river. I try to stay, at least keep one foot in the river, because that's your creative soul. And uh, yeah, wow. Uh, so that really resonates uh, with me. I feel like I've good. wandered. <laughs> yeah, you, and you don't do it intentionally. It's life pulls you away from it. All those things you have to do all the time. Yeah, life and jobs and kids yeah. and life. I was yeah. Painting. Yeah, I was painting and making a little more painting, but it wasn't paintings. Uh, you know, it was paintings you had to do. You had to live. You had to survive. Yeah. And and I mean, I'd try to get some of me into them when I could, but some of them is it's not. It's just a job you got to get done. Yeah. And I was really getting sick of it, and I really wanted to paint for myself. So I did a few paintings over the last few years for myself, but uh, then I got so busy with private contracts. People want me to do their painting. I kept raising the prices and they kept meeting the prices. And finally, <laughs> I raised them so high, I feel embarrassed. So I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm just going to paint for myself. I'm getting old and I've got, I might have 10, 15 years left. 10, you know. I know my parents both were really clear minded up till they was 85. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could do anything they always did. And, uh, and so, I'm 73. I got a few years. Um, so I'm going to paint for myself. Fantastic. Uh, I, I can't wait to see what you river. create. Stay I in your my river. My paint. In my river and paint. Just get so far into it, I'm painting in my river. I'd like to if, I, if that was possible. Fantastic. But, Put yeah. your waders on. Yeah, just go stand in my river. <laughs> uh, but yeah it's, it's it's like meditation you know it's getting back into what makes you tick you know finding yourself again yeah uh, so this piece i forget her name daphne or daphne street what Deshara's was her name street Deshara's. well Deshara. i was close it started with a d <laughs> that was a real, that was the model's real name uh Deshara. she uh I just moved back to Kentucky. Uh, Keith and I and Willingham was freelancing in, in Lake Geneva. And then 
Will was wanting to head back east or west. Uh, Keith was wanting to move to Pennsylvania. And I my neck of the woods. To, yeah. He's going to get closer to New York so he could go in and out for publishing and stuff. And I said, well, I'm going back to Kentucky. My wife's from Kentucky. I am too, same county. All of our parents were getting older and uh, we was mm -hmm. concerned. So we moved back here. And um, so I set a little studio up in town while we built the house I'm living in now. We had it built. And so I was in town. It was um, rented another little storefront, you know. Yeah. And I covered all the paper over all the windows so you couldn't see what was going on. I didn't want anybody to bother me. So you could. And the word <laughs> got around, the road got around, the word got around that I was, an artist was in there painting. And this girl just walks in one day. She was tall and pretty. And, and she just said, uh, uh, you're an artist? I said, yeah. She said, I could be your model. I could model for you for something. I go, yeah, you would make a great model. And so <laughs> we talked while she, can you photograph me now? I said, well, right. No, I, not right now. I got to think about it because my ideas are something. And I said, could you come back maybe in a day or two, something like that? Well, didn't see her for another several weeks. Mm. And uh, I was painting again. Bap, she comes in the studio. There she was all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, you're back. And uh, she said, can you take some pictures of me? And I said, you know, model, uh, can I model for you? I said, I grabbed my camera. And I looked down. I had to put a roll of film. And all I had was um, just a roll of 10. I'd accidentally got a roll of 10. I always get a roll of 36 or whatever. The most film I could get for a camera. Yeah. 35 millimeters. I remember and those days. Days of 24 yeah. and 36. And, uh, and you hoarded those photos. They, yeah. were, they were special. You, yeah, they were. And uh, so I only had a roll of 10. And so I had this red dress of a thing. My wife had found at uh, like a yard sale or something. She was looking for, I always told her to be on the lookout for some kind of costuming, you know? Mm -hmm. And she found this one. It's a neat looking, it didn't look like any particular, it's just ugly. <laughs> and so I, I had her put that on and she was sitting on the stool and I was starting to snap some pictures and all of a sudden I ran out of film because I only had 10 shots, I forgot. And so she's like, well, um, I I'll see you later. And she left and uh, I never saw her again. And I, oh, no. she, had a younger brother, she had a younger brother and I met him. I, I, I'd see him every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask her about her and she'd moved away or something. And about five years after this painting, um, I saw her brother, or maybe six years, and he said she had died. Oh. And uh, I thought, my did Lord, he say how? First model I knew that she did, did died, and mm. uh, I don't remember exactly what she died from, but she was in the hospital and died. That's a and, shame. Uh, and so I sort of kept that painting because she was a unique character and she was very unique look. She was tall and long arms and legs and. Uh, very Amazonian. Yeah, she was. And she, her personality was, uh, she didn't take any crap. You know, she was pretty sharp. I, I like her personality. Neat. Uh, she's a strong Neat. person. So then we have a troll and what looks to be a fairy. And he, a giant, not a troll, a giant off in the distance, walking away. And he's clubbed this poor fellow. Yeah. Well, this was another Dragon Magazine cover. Like I said, they mm -hmm. gave me, I you don't know, I could paint what I want to paint. So this, they said, the issue coming up is about, well, I was, they was tell me about three months ahead, you know, it's mm -hmm. about clerics. Okay. And, and, and. Uh, since I came from a D and D gaming world, um, um, a cler if you was running a game of Dungeons and Dragons, you need a cleric because clerics were they belong to some type of religion, a made up religion, if you wanted, you know, not, mm -hmm. uh, and they could ha they could heal you and um, other holy things, protect mm -hmm. different kind of spells and things. And so if it was a group of playing D&D, &D, you'd have to have a cleric around because you're always getting wounded 
and losing hit points and you can't fight unless you get the cleric to heal you up, you know? Right. And, uh, and so there's always a cleric involved. And so this, they said the, the, that issue is going to be about clerics. So, um, all right, I, I, I want to do something different. And, uh, so I, I, I wanted the girl healing a guy mm -hmm. and, um, and then, uh, I had to, come up with a scene where well, I was thinking about I'm sitting this I tell people it's like I got a little movie screen and right in my front of my forehead here inside my forehead it's <laughs> about about that big and about that wide and images complete images will sometimes will flash on it I don't know where mm. they come from how do you take but a snapshot about, I oh I just have to remember it and try to uh. pull it back up again and again I was thinking about this and the girl and cleric, and I, and I thought snow. It was winter in Wisconsin. I was a little mm -hmm. there then, and so a lot of snow. I thought I'll do a cold scene, and I was thinking of the cleric and uh, and um, healing somebody. And then all of a sudden, just like a camera clicked off my head on a little screen, I could see this scene. Uh huh. Not in every detail, but, but vaguely see the scene, almost like it's this little not out of focus, but just sort of almost like still flexible where you could move a little bit or something, but there it was. And so I kept pulling that back and, and, um, and uh, something else, I, I, I remember seeing a painting of, um, I think it's N.C. Wyatt. Um, yeah, I think it's N.C. Wyatt, but um, again, with my remembering names, there's a painting of there's a snow scene with look like pilgrims, like they're dressed in that kind of clothing. Yeah. Walking on the crest of a hill. There was just a sky and the snow hill and these figures in black. Yeah. And white. So, and that streak of the winter sky had a streak of yellow across it. And that, yeah. yellow, that yellow in that sky just did something for me. I remembered it my, you know, for years and years. And I thought, I'm going to. I could see that streak of sky in there in my mind. So I wanted to put that in because everything could be so muted, but that yellow sky. And so um, it's right behind the giant's face, too. It's, so yeah. it really draws yeah. you up to him. You kind of go, yeah. you go from that guy's hand up to his Again. face, then to her, yeah. then up the tree into the yellow, into the giant. So you've really got yeah. this circular. Uh huh. Right around the center. And um, Keith pose for uh, the dead guy and he also <laughs> posed for the giant <laughs> he's both i was laying on the floor with you know shooting up at him he walking away like you know uh trying to get a look and then i had him laying down i think we put some cushions on the floor and he laid back on him he was just in jeans and a t-shirt or whatever yeah and i needed i needed my um cleric and i can't remember for sure but i i don't know if we got her off the street you know, again, we had we was in the studio or in town where people walk by and look in. Yeah. Or we, we might have got a local girl um, around there. I don't know. I know we used uh, some waitresses sometimes out of the local restaurants where we'd eat breakfast. Keith and I would eat breakfast or yeah. lunch. Sometimes. But so, she's young. This she was, this model is she young. About, she looked young. I think she was 17 or 18. Mm. But she looked even I think she was 18, but she had a very innocent looking face. And I thought like a holy face, you know, just yeah, not, no, nothing sinister or evil looking about her, very pure. And so, and when I was painting this, the story came to me, they're, they're not lovers, they're brothers and sisters mm. working to, you know, and he being greedy and, and being a, her big brother and tough, he see this giant and the rest is there might have been others with them, but they hid in the woods. Well, if you can see on the giant, you can't see his glare, but around his belt, there's a chest of treasure, a big treasure chest hanging there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that's probably the, the the guy that's been knocked in the head, probably thought, I'll try to get this giant or somehow and get that treasure. So he confronts the giant, but I'll, the giant probably just bonked him on the head and walked on off. And that was it. <laughs> Sister comes running out of the woods trying to heal him, heal him you know. So oh. I don't know, it tells a story to me. And yeah. uh, so I, when I finish that painting, I think when I'm dead and gone, 
people say that's one of the best paintings I've ever done because mm -hmm. I've looked at that painting. I've always loved it. That's why we still have it. My wife loved it. My kids loved it. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I've looked at it just recently and, and, and studied it. And I, I don't know if I could paint it any better now, all these years later than then. I was in my, I was in my thirties, I guess, late thirties when I painted that. And here I am 73 and I painted my whole life. I don't think I could do it any better. Sometimes the, the muses just sit on your shoulder on rare occasions and you paint out of your, out of your head. Yeah. You, paint above your, you paint above your level. And um, that's happened to me in a few paintings. I wish it happened in every painting. But <laughs> it does. Yeah. Sometimes you just touched and, and, and you, uh, you do an exceptionally good job that painting above your level. That's what I call it. I don't know. Right. That's fantastic. We're keeping, we'll probably pass it on to the kids. Oh, cool. Yeah.